So I'm Stace Mandel in the Division of Chronic and Post-Acute Care here at CMS. Um, we're nested within the Quality Measurement and Value-Based Incentives Group within the Center for Clinical Standards and Quality. So I'm the Deputy Division Director for our division. We've been a very busy little division <laughs> and growing. So I have some quick questions. Um, I think I recognize some folks. Who was at the trainings in 2010 for the MDS 3.0? Hello. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> I was looking around the room. I think I recognize some folks. Um, well, I can tell you I've aged <laughs> in, the, uh, in, the, in those six years. Um, first of all, congratulations for a successful implementation of the MDS 3.0. You guys did a phenomenal job. Yay. <laughs> I, I mostly remember uh, Tom Dudley with the time thing, <laughs> the, the, the clock that was going um, behind him on that first screen, that was pretty funny. Um, those were really amazing um, days, those were terrific uh, trainings. Um, it was really wonderful to meet and interact with, with folks um, from the nursing home uh, provider community. Uh, you really have done an amazing job. And I just want to sort of reflect and lament a little bit back to over 87 and the days of when I worked as a nurse's aide in a nursing home in 1976. Those were the days that we forced residents to take showers who had never taken a shower before. They were used to tub baths. Those were the days when we would restrain. Those were the days when we would use heat lamps on open, huge, gigantic wounds. Those were the days when, and I remember doing it, we would, we would you know, tie our residents up and, and put, put uh, couches together um, to keep them in one place and immobile when it was about feeding and watering and not so much about nurturing. Um, I remember you know, working with really what amounted to patients or residents with, with Alzheimer's and, and how it just felt so overwhelming. And there was maybe you know, a, a handful of residents um, who had visitors. I, I remember it not being person-centered. Um, it was custodial centered. And, and those, were, those were hard times. I remember uh, riding along with my father, who's a, an Episcopal minister, and, and visiting um, those shut in and, and learning from a, a young child what it means to be vulnerable and frail. And haven't we come a long way? And the reason why we've come a long way is because of your commitment to doing the right thing and staying on the right path and taking the journey to, to ensure that long-term care and, and skilled nursing is of high quality and human-centered. Those are important features of, of really taking responsibility for our, for our fellow person and taking services to a place where they really need to be. So first of all, commend you and thank you. So the big step in the journey, you know, as, as Sharon had pointed out, was over 87. The Impact Act, which is what I'm going to review with you, um, is sort of a next step along the continuum. And it's not, um, well, I should say what's, you, what's unique about it is that it's not a provider-centered, and it's not about a silo. It's about what needs to happen together, um, both, both, of course, CMS in partnership with providers, but also providers with providers. So it's really bringing everything sort of up, up to date with, with what it really will take to ensure high quality care across the United States. So on that, how many people in the room have heard about the Impact Act? Great, that's good. It's a good read, it's, it's an interesting read. Um, so the Impact Act, let me see if I can manage to be highly technical here. 
the data, data element uniformity assessment domain standardization and the IMPACT Act. So the IMPACT Act is a, is a pretty long read. It's got a lot of very technical details in it. Um, it's primarily separated out by three sections. Um, the third section pertains to um, hospice services, and I will not go into that at all. It's not the area of my expertise, um, and it has a lot of, of very technical requirements. So the IMPACT Act, uh, the Improving Medicare Post-Acute Care Transformation Act, and I always emphasize the word transformation because really that's what it is. And if you think about how long it took to get from where we were, when I would hold that cigarette up to that trach of that resident, and tie other residents down and help stand up those heat lamps. Think about how long it took, and, and, and all of the residents and restraints, how long did it take to sort of unravel that? Change takes time, and it takes partnership, and it takes commitment, and it takes learning and lessons learned and making mistakes and brushing off and moving on because doing the right thing is always the right thing to do. But it's not that there's a, there's a quick switch to be flipped to make it happen. And so Congress was aware of the importance of, of um, working together um, on, on helping to improve healthcare services in the nation. And so this bipartisan bill was passed in September of 2014 and then signed into law by President Obama in October of 2014. So I always emphasize it was a bipartisan bill. It requires the standardized patient assessment data across post-acute care um, to enable, I think, things that are fairly obvious and folks probably understand and know. Quality care and improved outcomes is ultimately always what we're searching for. I think we would all want that as a beneficiary and as a consumer and as, as, a, as a family member or friend of someone who is going through the system of services. Um, and then data element uniformity um, to enable interoperability and comparability of data. And ultimately improving you know, and providing for patient-centered or resident-centered individual, how about person-centered goals that drive discharge planning. Um, and then exchangeability of data, as I just sort of touched on, and ultimately coordinated care. You can't defragment, that's, that's a word, a remedy the fragmentation without really looking at all the parts of the system and all the things that sort of need to happen to, to bring information together so that that information can carry with an individual as they go across you know, the entire trajectory of healthcare services and into long-term care or to their home, and home with home and community-based services. So the driving forces of the IMPACT Act, obviously to improve Medicare uh, beneficiary outcomes, and ultimately we know that when we move the needle for Medicare beneficiaries, we ultimately are moving the needle for all of the United States citizens um, and folks that you know, go into our healthcare systems. Provider access to longitudinal information to facilitate coordinated care, to enable comparable data and quality um, across post-acute care settings, to improve hospital discharge planning as well as actually post-acute care discharge planning, and research to enable payment models based on patient characteristics rather than provider type. So why the attention to post-acute care? Well, the escalating costs that exist, the lack of data standards and interoperability across the post-acute care settings. For those, I would imagine that everybody in this room knows that None of the provider types in post-acute care um, received any of the ARA high-tech funds and are not required to participate in meaningful use. But we do know <laughs> that there are some 35,000 providers where it was very important that they are involved in um, tr you know, care transitions and, and attending and receiving information. And so, the uh, sort of IT universe knows that if you have standardized data, that the ability to exchange that information, the exchangeability of the information te technically is far more feasible than if you're trying to sort of crosswalk information across provider settings. And so, oops, I think I missed one. 
yes, yeah, so that um, based on patient characteristics, individual characteristics. Okay, so um, these, the information on, on these particular four cards is slightly out of date um, because the numbers get updated all the time. Um, but it gives you the general sense of, of what is provided in the four provider types covered under the IMPACT Act required data reporting. Um, but just to reiterate, uh, the, po the post-acute care provider types included were the long-term acute care hospitals, home health agencies, inpatient rehab facilities, and skilled nursing facilities. The legislative uh, background on data standardization, some of you may be very familiar with this, others perhaps not. Um, it actually dates way, way back, even before the year 2000 with, uh, with BIPA. There's actually such old um, uh, legislative activities that it's in, in type. <laughs> like remember the old type print, you know, an IBM typewriter? But this is nothing new. It's just that it's finally kind of come to fruition. But BIPA required the Secretary to report to Congress, um, provide a report to Congress on standardized assessment items across post-acute care settings. So that's 16 years ago. Change takes time. The Deficit Reduction Act of the year 2000, the DRA, um, required that standardization of assessment items used at discharge from an acute care setting and at admission to a post-acute care setting. And it established the, um, the, what we call the PAC-PRD, or the Post-Acute Care Payment Reform Demonstration, to harmonize payments for similar settings um, in PAC settings. And, and that research um, gave way to uh, the, uh, the CARE tool, that, or the CARE item set. That's the Continuity Assessment Record and Evaluation Tool. Um, it was a component to test the reliability of standardized items when used in each Medicare setting. And oftentimes, I think there's a lot of confusion that sort of presents itself when we're at speaking engagements such as this where folks have left the Impact Act with the interpretation that it requires a one single standardized assessment tool and that that assessment tool is the care tool. So let's, I just sort of want to take this off the table. The care item set was basically a, a battery of item testing to um, identify reliability and validity um, of items across the provider types. Um, and so it was just sort of a, a big portfolio of items that, that were tested, um, and, and in, including at the time of discharge from the acute care hospital. Um, it's not that it was intended to be put in one full swoop, you know, if it was 100%, you know, you know, perfectly, you know, reliable and everything about it was just a shining star. Would that, it would be something to think about, but certainly we know that each provider type does have services that vary between the provider types. And so you would never have, the, the law does not require nor mandate that you not have the items necessary for those provider types. So I, I just wanted to kind of clarify that. Um, Again, you know, the, the, the Impact Act does not require a single assessment instrument um, to be implemented. So I just want to kind of take that off the table, because that is a question that we get sometimes. OK, so then kind of tying into the interoperability piece that I had been describing. So with the PAC-PRD, um, they also required that the items um, meet the health information technology interoperability standards. So this is kind of an interesting place that post-acute care has come to. Um, and that is the, the use and reuse of the standardized assessment data that you've been collecting for a long, long time to help really mobilize health information exchange across providers. So something that you've been used to will be a part of the solution for closing the gaps during transitions of care. And that's why this particular act is so significant, that it wasn't just for data to come into CMS, for us to calculate quality measures, you know, for, for you know, public reporting, or to have, you know, a, um, a penalty program for failure to report. It wasn't... This particular act is significant because it's part of a solution. 
It's about making the individual the center and having information being able to travel with the individual across the providers and into even their home-based um, living environment if they go into the community, into their own home. So I just wanted to point to that because I do think that's one very unique aspect about, uh, about this law. So there's some uh, guiding uh, goals and, and principles, and I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> but but from, really from the PAC-PRD and the care, the work with the care item set, we learned a lot of very valuable um, pieces of information about how, what the standardized data can, can really solve and what it can do, but what it needs to have. And so really go down to the bottom of the slide where it says data uniformity, and that's what the impact is talking about when it talks about the standardized data, it's the assessment data. The assessment data being transferable, being uniform. It's very difficult to accurately communicate information if we're talking about an orange here, but my system can only take app, you know, what we talk about apple, or we talk about fruit <laughs> in this provider. So it really is about data uniformity. Um, so that it can be reusable, so that it is informative, because it's very important that the data elements that are considered for transfer of care are useful. Useful to the receiving provider, useful to the sending provider to get, to send to, to or they feel like it's valuable and important information. I ran an emergency department <clears throat> in the state of Maryland. Um, it was the fifth busiest um, in the state. I can't tell you how many individuals we received from, from uh, nursing homes um, and skilled nursing facilities with information that we could not read. What would life be like if we could change that? If we could jump in in the golden hour and instead of um, having to fork through, you know, mimeograph pieces of paper, um, that we had it electronically. Think about that for yourselves or your loved ones, what that looks like. How does that change the landscape and quickly caring for individuals who trust us with their lives? And data element, um, one of the most important guiding principles is that the data be reliable and valid and that it be able, as I sort of said, to facilitate care coordination. And then, the other guiding principle surrounding interoperability is that data that can communicate in the same language across settings is, is critical. If, you think, if I think about um, an individual that we would receive in the emergency department when we were standing up the stroke centers and, and identifying where they were and their scales and how we could communicate in numbers across the, across the hospital and how that information could be quickly conveyed um, throughout their entire stay. If you think about how important it is to know what what's someone's, to have baseline information, an Aldredi score, an APGAR score, what that, the power of that, looking through the same lens, can do for interpretation and, and, and patient services and, and helping the individual who's relying on you. And that, Uniform data is, it really does allow for the backward and forward movement of, of information and to follow the individual. The ultimate goals, I think we all understand the ultimate goals are to foster seamless care transitions, data information that can follow the person, um, evaluation of longitudinal outcomes um, for individuals that traverse the settings, assessment of quality across uh, the providers, improving outcomes and efficiency, and, and the reduction of provider burden. We, we appreciate the importance of that. Okay, so as we put together this work, we're guided by the National Quality Strategy. I'm not gonna read all of these out loud, but there are basically six critical principles um, involved in the National Quality Strategy, um, making care safer, ensuring um, engagement of the individual and their family members and their loved ones, their friends, promoting effective communication, I guess I am going to read them out loud, <laughs> in coordination of care, promoting effective prevention and treatment practices, working with communities to promote wide use of best practices, um, and to make uh, quality care more affordable for individuals, families, employers, and governments by developing and spreading the, 
uh, new healthcare delivery models. I'm probably doing this all wrong. Okay. So CMS, um, as part of the Affordable Care Act, um, was required to stand up a, a CMS quality strategy. And so we align with a national quality strategy, and we make it a little simpler. Making care safer, strengthening person and family engagement, promoting effective communication and coordination of care, um, promoting effective prevention and treatment, and working with communities to promote best practices of healthy living and making care affordable. What's sort of to tie in with what I was saying about the uniqueness and the importance of the IMPACT Act is its ability to reach three very hard goals. Strengthening person and family engagement as partners in their care. Throughout the IMPACT Act, and especially in the section that talks about discharge planning and the promulgation of, of the conditions of participation to include as part of discharge planning, using data to help inform the next love, you know, the next service entry for that individual is a part of really bringing to the forefront persons, persons and not systems, really making the system work for the individual. What are their preferences? What are their goals? What do they need? What do they desire? That's now going to be, according to law, needs to be a part of the process. Promoting effective communication and coordination of care, that's obvious in the importance of the use of, of the standardized data um, for, for interoperability purposes, and promoting effective prevention and treatment of chronic disease. So when we talk about standardized data, so uh, we have four assessment instruments and the four provider types, and, and really what the goal is to have core data elements that are uniform um, across the four assessment instruments. And at the center of, of this kind of cool picture, um, you can see where uniformity lies. And that's those core data elements that would be um, made, you know, stand, you know, have the standards and the interoperability, the HIT code that goes along with them, and so forth for the exchangeability of information. And for those that, you, that don't know, although I think probably everyone in this room is quite savvy to this, is what is standardization. It's really looking at information at the data at sort of the atomic level, you know, that we ask the same question for eating, and that's sort of the example on this slide. I think it sort of tells it well. And then uh, this is just yet another example of a, of a function um, assessment question, um, set of questions on the right, and then the standardized response codes on the left. And really, in the ideal state, and, and I don't know if, if you appreciate this or not, but what's very unique about post-acute care, and you've been doing it a long time, is submitting data once, collect once, used for multiple purposes. So the data elements that you collect, the assessment questions and responses that you use, do many things. They're used by you for care planning and decision support, for quality improvement. They're used by CMS for payment for quality reporting, and they're used for, by you and the individual for ensuring transitions in care. The one to the right is the new one. That's a part of this transformation. That's why this is so important. So in reaching the ideal state, there's tremendous opportunities, real-time use of the standardized and interoperable data to transform healthcare services through care coordination, on-time clinical decision support, and provider-level quality improvement. If you think back, if any of you are involved at all with the standing up of the stroke centers and what was able to happen with EMS in the field, with, with public service announcements about what to do if you suspect that your loved one is having a stroke, and what hospitals across this country were able to do in mitigating the, the long-term effects of stroke, it's phenomenal. We can do this. We can get there. It takes time. It takes commitment. It takes collaboration. But in the ideal state, we would want to enable and support information to follow the individual across the healthcare system and into their own home, home and community-based services, long-term services and support. Think about how important that is for individuals who may not be in the system, but they are very much in need of good coordinated care as they're living their lives in the community. 
supporting transformation from a fragmented um, post-acute uh, healthcare delivery system and payment system to a, an individual-centered one. Okay, some of these guiding principles involve um, not just the development of the quality measures and the items used for quality measures, but in the work that's underway for the standing up of those sort of core items that I had been describing to you, the core items that would be applied in the four assessment instruments as required by law. And so some of the principles guiding that work is that the data be reusable, which we just I just described, that it be reusable and able to um, convey a, a spoken language in the IT language, so to speak, to enable interoperability, to facilitate care coordination through standardized communication, and be usable across the continuum of care and beyond the healthcare system. So that's really the ideal state. Why would we shoot for anything less than the ideal state, right? Would that, that wouldn't make any sense. We don't want to, we want to really continue to strive for what's the best thing overall. And the other guiding principles is that the data elements selected for use reside in the public domain, that items uh, development shall occur through consensus-based development process, that we use current science, and that we adhere to the statutory requirements under the Impact Act of 2014. And in the ideal state, the individual traverses the system and the information follows with them. Oops, I'm almost done. So let me go back one slide. So the assessment, so the quality measures that are required um, have various dates for implementation that are required by law, by provider type, and by measure. Um, and the assessment-based um, data uh, though there's two dates, October 1, 2018, and January 1, 2019. And sort of those core, the data elements that must satisfy sort of those core uh, five categories are functional status, cognitive function, and mental status, special services, treatments, and interventions, medical conditions and comorbidities, impairments, and other categories as required by the secretary. And there is the timeline that nobody will be quizzed on. Um, it is a very, very, very aggressive timeline. I will, I can attest to that. Um, I have aged a lot since 2014, um, but we are on track. Um, so it's in, I think you guys have access to this slide, so if you wanna look it up, if you have any questions, please, of course, reach out. Um, and I think with that, I will bring up my colleague, uh, Sharon Lash who is joining me to present on the SNF quality reporting program. Hello again, everyone. Thank you, Stacy. That was very helpful, setting the context. I, I can tell you, only having been with DCPAC only about, oh, about seven or so months, uh, I have been learning, probably along with everybody else, what this all means, how it works. Come, I did, you know, three years at survey and certification uh, in the Division of Nursing Homes at CMS, and the emphasis is very different, and we didn't have to engage the quality measures as such. And so this has been a learning experience for me as well, so I appreciate the, you know, any kind of confusion that you may have over the different programs. Um, first of all, I wanna echo Stacy's sentiments in thanking everybody for their very hard work in this um, endeavor of skilled nursing care. We understand how hard it is and how, how complex it has become over the years. And um, we hope that you see this as another opportunity to help your QAPI initiatives to um, improve and, and uh, you know, hone your processes throughout the, your facility. I got one question, and I want to um, address this before I launch into the policy aspects of the rule that was passed last year. And <clears throat> I think I wanna make some distinctions out the gate here. So first question we got is, how do measures used in the quality reporting program differ from the quality measures used in the five star and nursing home compare? And I think that's a really good and valid question. Um, they are completely separate and distinct. So the 13 measures, including the five short stay measures and the third, and um, let's see, no, it's actually 18, 
total measures in nursing home compare, I'm sorry, five uh, short stay and 13 long stay, separate and distinct, relevant only to the nursing home compare five-star program. They will be reported separately and there will be no overlap. Uh, in fact, the measures will have different specifications. So uh, that is why we want to make some really good distinctions across the nursing home quality initiative for the um, you know, five-star nursing home compare program, the quality reporting program, and the value-based purchasing program. And I'm going to be working on kind of an infographic to explain the differences, statutory basis for all of these programs to help you understand how they differ and where they uh, originate from in law. So the quality reporting program has at least two functions. One is to determine the annual payment update uh, via the quality measures. So these three quality measures will be calculated uh, if you will be uh, compliant with 80% of the measures on, on all of your uh, assessments, you will be eligible for the annual payment update. That's one aspect of the quality reporting program. The second aspect, and that is to be decided in further rulemaking, is the how the, this data is publicly reported, which is another requirement under the IMPACT Act, uh, that the quality measures that are being collected under the quality reporting program are publicly reported. Um, and, I, and I encourage you to watch IRF and LTEC for these activities because they are a little bit more ahead of time in the timelines for public reporting than the skilled nursing facilities are. So those are the two tracks right now that you, know, you should be aware, aware, cognizant of. So the APU 20%, 2% update and, and public reporting. Now we established the uh, the policy initiatives, the policy uh, details in, the, in last year's rule, uh, the PPS uh, rule. So that's what I'm going to be presenting to you today. So it's not going to be exactly, you know, stimulating and riveting, but I'll do my best. Um, so in response to the Impact Act that Stacy just went through, um, we are now, DCPAC is charged with developing the details, hashing out how we do it. What are, what are we asking? Where we turned for guidance and some precedent at CMS is the inpatient quality reporting programs, you know, the uh, PQRS, things that preceded us, in, uh, especially in uh, the Affordable Care Act. Work began in... Uh, 2011, 2012, based on in, uh, the initiatives coming from the Affordable Care Act in IRF and LTEC. So we used what we learned from the IRF and LTEC to help, uh, help guide us setting our policy requirements for the Skilled Nursing Facility Quality Reporting Program. So in essence, what the statute says is that providers that do not submit the required quality measures data may receive a 2% point reduction to their annual payment update for the applicable payment year. Now, the good thing is, and, and Stacy covered this, is you're already submitting MDS data. Uh, we already know that uh, the majority of skilled nursing facilities, if not all, already comply with their requirements uh, to receive their APU updates. You're, you know, you, you have many years of, of submitting the MDS data, and you know how to go into CASPER to pull your reports, to monitor your own uh, performance. So we wanted to make sure that this was something that you could easily adapt to and shift towards as we try to develop measures across settings, uh, the, across the PAC settings. <clears throat> So, uh, like I said, for more information, please do visit our SNF QRP website that is a little bit under construction, but hopefully we'll get it to, <clears throat> to more of a um, uh, logical and rational format for you where you don't have to go searching and getting frustrated to find what downloads are where, and <clears throat> et cetera. So. so, 
like I, uh, we have been alluding to, we have adopted three quality measures for the quality reporting program that will be collected beginning October 1st of 2016 for the fiscal year 2018 and subsequent annual payment update determinations. All of these quality measures use assessment data from the MDS, <clears throat> and uh, if you have uh, a lot of curiosity and like this kind of reading, please do visit the uh, um, CF 42 CFR part, part 483, Medicare Program, Prospective Payment System, and Consolidated Billing for Skilled Nursing Facilities. That is our rule. This is where we work out, hash out, and receive comments on all of the initiatives that we plan to implement under the Act. So the, the things I'm going to be covering today from that um, rule are, uh, it, they include the G, Section G, which is form, manner, and timing of quality data submission, uh, H, which is SNF QRP data completion thresholds for the fiscal year 2018 payment determination and subsequent years. Um, we have Section J, which is the SNF QRP submission exception and extension requirements for the fiscal year 2018 payment determination and subsequent years. Oops. Uh, we have the Section K, which is the SNF QRP reconsideration and appeals procedures for the payment determination. We're going to address briefly the public display of quality measure data for SNF QRP, which we have not yet proposed. So that is under consideration. We'll be thinking about that and probably proposing that in the next rule for um, the PPS fiscal year 2018. <clears throat> so under G, Section G, and um, this is where you know we we talk about how you you know what what you what you report, how you report it, and when you report it. So for uh, participation timing for new skilled nursing facilities, this is a little bit um, kind of difficult to work through, uh, but I'll, I, I will read it through with you and kind of parse it out. A new skilled nursing facility would be required to begin reporting data on any quality measures finalized for that program year by no later than the first day of the calendar quarter subsequent to 30 days after the date on its CMS certification number, notification letter. And to, you know, simple, plain language, making it more simple, here is the example that we provide you to help you understand <clears throat> it's not as complicated as it seems. So for fiscal year 21, 2018 payment determinations, if, you, if a, a new skilled nursing facility received their CCN on August 28, 2016, and 30 days are added to that, so that um, makes it August 28th plus 30 days, takes you to September 27th, that SNF would be required to submit data for residents who are admitted beginning on October 1. So it's... Hopefully it's very clear there. Um, the data collection timelines and requirements for the fiscal year 2018 payment determination and subsequent years um, will, you know, CMS will collect data on residents who are admitted to the skilled nursing facility on and after October 1st, 2016 and discharged from that facility up to including uh, December 31st. 2016. So in other words, we are using one quarter of data submitted on the MDS to determine 2018 annual payment update. And this uh, is done because, first of all, we have precedent in other quality reporting programs, and this is how it uh, has been done in the past. And, and the rationale for using one quarter of data is to remain consistent with the usual October schedule for release schedule for the MDS <clears throat> to give providers a sufficient amount of time to update their systems so that they can comply with the new data reporting requirements 
and to give CMS a sufficient amount of time to determine compliance for the, for the fiscal year 2018 program. So we have you know, a lot of calculations in the background, um, and we, you know, we want to make sure that we calculate this appropriately so that your uh, annual payment update uh, determination is accurate. So the proposed use of one quarter of data for the initial year of quality reporting is consistent with the approach we use to implement another of quality reporting programs, as I mentioned, including LTEC, ERF, and hospice quality reporting programs. So H, uh, section H of the final rule discusses the data completion thresholds for fiscal year 2018, and that's that one quarter again. So. Um, you must report all of the data necessary to calculate the quality measures on at least 80% of the MDS assessments that, they, that, that are submitted. A provider is compliant with the quality reporting program requirements if all of the data necessary to calculate the measures has been submitted to fully calculate the quality measure. So for example, a measure cannot be calculated um, when the use of a dash is is used, so that you know, which mean, you know, indicates that a uh, provider wasn't able to perform, for example, a pressure ulcer assessment. Well, you know, uh, to ease any concern, uh, we're very interested in what the use of the dash was in uh, in in the nursing facilities, and it is very minor. I mean, it would not affect anyone's annual payment update. It is under 2% um, in, well, it's under, sometimes point uh, under 1%. But one thing that we might encourage you to think about in the use of dashes uh, in order for us to be able to calculate our quality reporting program measures is to make sure that you do give a little more attention to height and weight. Um, that might help us calculate these quality measures more accurately. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say about that. But right now, your DASH use is not a concern for your compliance determination with the uh, quality reporting program. Under Section J, Submission Exception and Extension Requirements for the Fiscal Year 2018 determination and subsequent years, so our experience with other quality reporting programs has shown there are times when providers are unable to submit quality data due to extraordinary circumstances beyond their control. Obviously, you know, uh, natural or man-made disasters. And certainly I understand, you know, from I uh, worked in Florida for four years with the state survey agency. And that was back in 2005 when we had five hurricanes and Katrina hit New Orleans. So, you know, those, there are definite issues with that. We understand that could interrupt your electronic systems and data submission efforts. So for that reason, um, CMS has a, a policy for all of the quality reporting programs that a skilled nursing facility may request an exception or extension for the quality reporting program within 90 days of the date that the extraordinary circumstances occurred. So you may request that exception or extension for one or more quarters by submitting a written request to the CMS Skilled Nursing Facility Exception and Extension mailbox. Um, this mailbox will be activated when the QRP is implemented at the and you can access it by this link. And we do have that spelled out on our website for any further information that you may need. I believe the mailbox is functional now, but um, you know, nobody's received any. Uh, we're not collecting data yet. So I'm sure you're not using it or have, have looked for it. Um, so if you try to uh, send a request to CMS by calling or you know, uh, sending a formal letter, through any other channel than that uh, mailbox, um, it's not considered as valid request for an exception or extension. It has to be submitted formally and officially through that um, mailbox for, your an for any annual payment uh, determination. Okay, come on.
having trouble advancing. Sorry. There we go. I think the. Okay. <clears throat> the reconsideration and appeals procedure. Um, beginning with the fiscal year 2018 payment determination, a skilled nursing facility would receive a notification of noncompliance if CMS determines that the pr provider failed to submit data in accordance with the data reporting requirements with respect to the applicable fiscal year. So you will be notified if you are not eligible for your annual payment update. The purpose of this notification is to inform the, the provider that the skilled nursing facility has been identified as being non-compliant with the quality reporting program rec reporting requirements for that applicable fiscal year. <clears throat> that you, the provider will be scheduled to receive a reduction in the amount of two percentage points to its market basket percentage update for the applicable fiscal year. That the provider may file, uh, we will inform you how to file a request for reconsideration in this communication <clears throat> if you believe that the finding of noncompliance is in error. So, um, or if you have already submitted a request for an extension or exception uh, that has not yet been decided upon, maybe you know, overlapping times due to the extraordinary circumstances, events kind of collides with the, the, the time that you have to be, you know, uh, determined non-compliant. There may be some overlaps that you may need to clarify. Uh, and that the provider must follow a defined process on how to file a request for reconsideration, which will be described in the notification. It is spelled out and um, the steps are defined very precisely. We would only consider requests for reconsideration after a skilled nursing facility has been found to be non-compliant. And that's kind of stating the obvious. Why would you, you know, if you're compliant, why would you ask for a reconsideration? <clears throat> so section L is the public display of quality measure data for the SNF QRP and um, it is due to begin in fall of 2018. The public reporting will include a period for review and correction of quality data prior to the public display of the skilled nursing facility performance data, which will initially include data on the three quality measures addressed in this presentation. So, um, Yes, this will be this the, the the your performance on these measures will be publicly reported. Will they be separate from the nursing home compare? Yes, because it is a completely different program. And have we decided where this is going to live? No. Um, we're going to watch very carefully how the ERF and LTEC public reporting goes and decide then where we should locate the uh, quality reporting. Um, program uh, as, you know, performance measures. Uh, so, like I said, watch IRF and LTEC uh, for examples on the public reporting and what that looks like. Now, they are much more advanced uh, in their quality reporting program, and they also have NHSN, the, CD, the in, uh, healthcare acquired infection disease data. So their quality reporting program requirements are much more advanced, and uh, they have many more measures right now than the quality reporting program for skilled nursing facilities. So we're going to uh, present you with uh, knowledge checks along all of the presentations and so we're going to be starting that now with this presentation so check your understanding so if a dash is used to code an MDS item that is included in the calculation of a quality measure that item cannot be used in the calculation of the measure is this true or is this true or false so we're going to give you, give you time to access your clickers on your table to answer this question. And uh, I'm going to advance to the next slide to start the timer. You'll have 60 seconds to answer this question. And here we go. True or false, one or two.
What? Oh. Do you need any help? Has everybody answered the question? OK, I think you've had enough time. So 95% of you answered. And so we're going to see what the uh, result is. And that is true. Anybody have any questions or comments about that? OK, we're going to move on to the next. So beginning with. Um, Fiscal year 2018 payment determination, skilled nursing facilities must report all of the data necessary to calculate the quality measures on at least 80% of the MDS assessments that they submit. Is this true or false? And we're going to start the timer. Is that okay? Are we going all right? Is it working? Okay. <clears throat> All right, has everybody submitted? Okay, I'm going to, I think 30 seconds is enough for this crowd here. So, 97% of you answered, and it's true. So the 97% answered correctly. Next, next question. If a skilled nursing facility provider is unable to submit quality data due to extraordinary circumstances beyond their control, for example, natural or man-made disasters, they may request an exception or extension. True or false? I think 30 seconds will be sufficient in determining this. <laughs> so should I advance to see the response? If I advance now, will the response accumulate? OK. OK, 100% of you said it's true. And yeah, you can request you know, a request for exception or extension. Um, and finally, a skilled nurf nursing facility may, accept, may request an exception, oh wait a minute, yes, exception or extension for the SNF QRP within 120 days of the date that the extraordinary circumstances occurred. Is this true or false? Whoops. Hi. <laughs> I went too fast. Can I back up? Just leave it. Okay. So tell me your what tell me what you think and then we'll we'll check the answers. Sorry about that, folks. Still learning logistics here. Go ahead. So is this true or false, that you have 120 days? False. false, thank you. You have how many? 90, great. Oh my gosh, you guys are paying attention. All right. So um, as we grow closer to the implementation date for this data um, you know, submission for the SNF QRP, we are ramping up our efforts. We are increasing provider outreach. Please watch CMS gov for announcements regarding our continued outreach in advance of the October 1st implementation of the SNF quality reporting program. Um, we do have plans, as uh, Mark has indicated, that this will be webcast uh, because there is a lot of interest. There are 15,000 providers who need this information. We understand that. And um, we're very happy to pr provide this in-person training, um, but we know that we need to reach a lot more people. 
For that reason, um, and I don't have the specific dates with me, but they are listed on the um, website. But next month, we will be hosting a national provider call. I think it is the second week in July. I think it's the Wednesday after the 4th, if I'm not mistaken. But please uh, go to the website. And um, we will be having probably another in-person training of some, some sort in August. And then again, September, we will be having a webcast national provider call uh, in, in advance of the October 1st implementation. Um, we will be, I will be posting a fact sheet on, the, on our website to help you know, uh, convey all of the policy requirements around this quality reporting program to give you a quick reference guide, and any other information that you may uh, like to see, like, for example, the infographic that we really need to produce to help you distinguish across the different quality programs at CMS for skilled nursing facilities. Um, that's, you know, something like that. If you want to see something different or, you know, what, what would meet your needs in terms of communications, we'd be very happy to hear from you. Uh, so. Uh, with the time we have remaining, do a question and answer session. And as Mark mentioned, uh, we request that you go to the microphone and um, ask your question there. So please go ahead. I don't know if I can answer it on the fly. Sometimes we need to do a little bit of research, but we will be sure to record that question and get back to you if I can't answer this. Hi. Hi. Uh, James Muller, Senior Director Hi, of Research from ARCA. Um, the 2% payment penalty um, for underreporting or poor reporting, it's framed as 80% um, of the assessments. The measures are calculated at the stay level, um, all of that, um, rather than the assessment level. So some will have more assessments, some will have less assessments. Is the actual unit of observation for the 80% the stay or the assessment? I, uh, RTI? Back me. It's it's the assessment. It's the assessments. Okay. Are you guys open to talking about the details of that? Detail. Uh, the technical details. Technical details. Yeah. Stacy. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Stacy. She's my mentor. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> There's eighty percent of the items that are used to calculate the measure. Got it. Whatever the measures are. So if there's three assessment questions, mm -hmm. um, there has to be out of, you know, when those are submitted mm -hmm. for a provider, mm -hmm. at least 80% of the time, mm -hmm. they have to be, um, you know, something other than a dash. Okay. Very good. So you're Is saying that? per measure. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So it's, it's dependent on the items used for the measure okay. that are used to calculate the measure or risk adjust the measure. Okay. Right. Does that help? That's good. good question. Yeah. I mean, it, it would be useful if CMS at some point published the detailed logic for it, because it's for, for providers to be able to understand that and for us to be able to help them with it. Sure. We, certainly, that's good feedback. It was, I'm pretty sure it was spelled out in the rule, but I don't know if everybody reads the Federal Register, but we will definitely. That's great to, to Thank help you, guide us. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, good morning and thank you. You mentioned that we should be on the lookout for the ERF and the LT Care data set reporting. About when would that happen? The, uh, that's the ERF and LTIC public reporting. Oh boy, so um, <laughs> we're in the middle of all of the requirements um, and testing. So we are looking at um, late fall uh, 2016 for, for ERF and LTIC public reporting Great. to begin. Thank you. Thank you. One more question, sorry. Um, <laughs> section G and Section GG, do you guys have any more thinking about the trend, if you will transition away from Section G and drop that eventually and maybe shift the rug system to GG? That is a very good question. As we roll out GG, now, and, and we will be talking about this measure in, in future sessions. But this is a new application. This is a brand new measure. We want to see how it performs across settings because we are trying to meet the intent of the impact act with this measure. 
It would be very nice if we could replace G at some point after we determine that GG performs as we hope it does, not only in, within SNF but across the, the PAC providers. So I think that is the ultimate goal. Um, but you know, we have four different assessment instruments out there that we're trying to align. And yes, I mean, it would be very good, but I think we really need to test the performance of GG before we can make any statement about that. Absolutely agree. I mean, it would be a very good thing to do um, and should be done. So, all right, thank you. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Hi, my question is, the 80%, is it 80% of all MDSs submitted or just PPS assessments submitted? Because the measures seem to carry both resident, all, you know what I mean? So for the IMPACT Act, it is part A PPS uh, assessment items on, uh, you know, under this measure. So that's the answer to that question. Okay, thank you. And uh, Stacy has some additional information. <laughs> so just to, just thank you, that was excellent. So just to elaborate a little <laughs> bit on that. So the um, items that are used to calculate the measure <laughs> for uh, folks that are under a Part A stay are what are used to determine the compliance, right? So there are, you know, if you have an individual who's discharged from the facility and you fill out the OBRA discharge assessment, we'll pull the items for that Medicare beneficiary off of that assessment instrument, right? So I just wanted to be, to be clear about that because they could be leaving the facility, they're under a Part A stay, and they're leaving the facility, you, you know, you wouldn't fill out a Part A discharge and an OBRA, right? Just to clarify. Next, thank you. Is this Medicare fee-for-service patients only, or does it include Medicare Advantage? No. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> Any other questions right now before we turn it back over to Mark? Yes, okay. <laughs> Part A stays. Part A stays. Part A. My question is around the interoperability. Oh. I run a trade association. Our state has received some of the recent money to get it going, but they're oh, doing right. nothing. We have got to, you have all got to encourage our states to work with us because the fact that the this sector got no monies to work towards interoperability. We're now up against a deadline. We've got to get our nursing homes. And when you live in a state like Kansas, you know, you have urban, rural, frontier, you, CMS has to put some pressure on the states to get these interoperability grants out to us and get the program going. We're so, not doing it yet. I just want to make sure I'm following your, your comment. So, mm -hmm. go ahead. So, just make sure, let me parrot it back and make sure I'm, I'm following. So, so, you are receiving funds? In Kansas, you just, CMS just sent, some money out not too long ago. So mm -hmm. some um, we all applied for funds through our um, through our folks that are currently doing the information networks. Mm -hmm. We were a part of that. Mm -hmm. It's the first time skilled nursing is a part of it. Mm -hmm. But it has hit a now in Kansas they've got the grant, but we haven't done anything with it yet. Mm -hmm. We haven't we haven't done anything. So I'm just saying that I think the Medicaid agencies need to be pushed a little bit harder. If, you've, if they've got the money, if they got some of this recent mm -hmm. grant money, you understand that in a lot of our rural areas, we don't have interoperability yet. Mm -hmm. Even between, in an urban area between the hospitals and some of our post-acute places. Mm -hmm. So we're really behind on getting that done. And mm -hmm. you're... And, the, and everyone is telling us how important it is to, that the information is shared. Mm -hmm. But when you don't have one piece sharing it, it's just not done on a consistent basis throughout mm -hmm. all providers in our state. That's my point. Right. So I, I very much appreciate what you're suggesting. Um, we, you know, I, it's, it's kind of ironic for me where I spent, you know, my entire career in either in, in military um, hospitals or... <laughs> or you know, in hospitals to be in the Division of Chronic and Post-Acute Care. And I have tremendous empathy and respect for the fact that there are 35,000 providers 
um, who you know need to be a part of this system, and the home and community-based services part of the spectrum as well. So what I would encourage you to do is obviously stay plugged in with your state, you know, and uh, and 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 also. I, but I wanted to stress that the Impact Act um, doesn't require interoperability, right? So I just wanted to make sure because there are sometimes it has been sort of overly interpreted to read that it requires that the providers engage in interoperable exchange, and that's actually not the case. But I would highly encourage you, obviously, to stay involved with the states and, and, and work with, um, I, see your, I see your facial expression, but and I appreciate that. And also, if there's a place um, within uh, CMS or ONC um, that you want to submit any comments or questions to, um, I think that would be very helpful. I'll also pass that along to um, our, our sort of colleagues, um, not sort of, they are our colleagues, in, in the Office of the National Coordinator as well. That would be very helpful. If you can submit that to the yeah. SNFQRP um, or write it down so we can capture that. Otherwise, my memory, my memory's aging, so <laughs> I lose track. Yeah. This is a very, um, kind of a thorny, issue for a lot of providers because we know that the use of electronic systems in the post-acute care world is very uneven, where we have all paper systems to all electronic systems and everything in between with hybrid charts, with hybrid el electronic records. Um, so, I, you know, we're very sympathetic to your, to your concerns and, uh, you know, just make sure that you keep communicating with CMS about the barriers that you have in, in, in achieving interoperability. Yes, I have a question about, um, so this is about SNF PPS assessments, these QR, uh, these items. So is it going to be based on assessment reference dates on October 1st and later, or on admissions on October 1st or later? Admissions. So if someone's on Medicare in September, they would not be in this um, process, even if I'm doing a 30-day in October? Hmm. Have to map it out. Yeah, uh, very good question. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. I don't know if any of our colleagues in RTI have uh, investigated this, and I don't know if this has okay. been addressed in LTEC and IRF, but it's an excellent question, and thank you for bringing it to our attention. We'll try to have an answer t before you leave tomorrow. Yeah, I'd have to go back to the rule, yeah. um, but I um, am pretty sure it begins with admissions in October. October 1. Yeah. October 1, so we would have to work on the back end to, to, to sift, sift them out. Right. I have a question about the value-based purchasing measure under PAMA, the hospital readmission, is that going to be reported in the same space that these three quality measures are going to be reported in? That will be determined. Uh, our colleagues in another division are developing that measure, and uh, we are working with the Division of Nursing Homes to make these reporting um, venue, you know, avenues as clear as possible so that there is dis they're distinct, that you can tell one from the other. So no, this has not been yet determined and your input will be, you know, sought. We appreciate your feedback. What would, what would you suggest? Well, I guess I'm already starting to think how confusing this can all be because you're going to have five star. Now you're going to have this with the three measures that we're discussing now and I'm sure Thank more to come. Right. And, yeah. and then the PAMA. So to me, if it could all be consolidated, it would be the easiest, but that's just me speaking. <laughs> so how many people would like to see an, a, a consolidation on a, can we have a kind of an informal raising of hands? Consolidate on one page so you can refer to it every, in one time, one go. For, for the QRP. For the QRP, for the VBP, and Nursing Home Compare, one page. <laughs> huh, okay. Thank you. I mean, one of the purposes is for consumers to be able to pick a place. And how will they know, oh, well, here's Nursing Home Compare, and then I got to go to here to look at the quality reporting, then I got to go here to look at the value based purchasing. I think consumers will be confused. So, so I'm not a technical person. So, what if there was a link 
from Nursing Home Compare to NIFQRP. It's good to hear. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's really, this is valuable feedback. Thank you. All right. Yeah, we want to make this, you know, this website work for you, the provider who is required to comply with all of these requirements under the various legislative initiatives that have been coming forward. You know, I, I do want to acknowledge the work that has been going on in DC PAC in a very, very short period of time where, you know, the Impact Act was passed and then that gave us very clear deadlines for reporting all of our requirements. Um, so, you know, it, it is something very much under development, very fast moving pieces, and um, we, we are faced with a lot of decisions here. So we're very, very interested in your feedback and appreciate it. Thank you. Anything else? Any other questions anybody has? Now for measure specific information, you know, I'm, I'm the quality reporting program coordinator, so I'm not as in the weeds as maybe our measure developers are. You know, I'm getting up to speed with all of the terminology and things like that. Uh, so if you have measure specific questions, um, you know, you're, feel, feel free to ask the, of our measure, ex, measure lead experts uh, and subject matter experts who are going to be speaking later uh, today and tomorrow. All right, I want to thank you for your patience with me in discussing all of these very dry policy matters. And we're going to be turning this back to Mark uh, for further uh, information. Thanks, everybody.